Hi, my name is Skylar Stasny and welcome to Curiosities of Kopschaholm. As the curator of Kopschaholm, I know that this historic house is an extremely important way to share the history of the Oliver family, the home they lived in, and their contributions to our community. Today I'm going to talk about ivory. So the Olivers have several ivory pieces that we keep here in the morning room. And the morning room is one of the rooms in the house where the ladies would come to plan their day, or if the Olivers were having several people people over, this would be where the ladies would retire to afterward while the men would go upstairs. So I'm going to get into this cabinet so we can start talking about some of these pieces. So all of the ivory pieces that we have are all decorative. Um, ivory carving didn't really become popular in Western society until between the years of 1868 and 1912. So Japan was trying to change up their, their ivory selling, and that's where these figures came into play. So they're known as okamonos, and that just means decorative object. So they were made primarily as an export. They were exported from Japan into New England, and then they would be purchased throughout, uh, throughout the country. So some of these pieces are made of elephant ivory, but they're also made up, could be made of several different types of ivory. So there's ivory from walrus tusks, um, sperm whale teeth, narwhal horns, and warthog tusks and hippopotamus teeth. So for example, this would be one example of an okamono. So this is a woman carrying a child on her back. And at the base, there is a fan laying at her feet. And these are very intricate, detailed figures. Uh, these would be used in a Japanese home as a way to decorate a very specific part of their home. These were specifically created to appeal to Victorian people of that time. And on the bottom of all of these, or at least most of them, is a maker's mark or a signature in Japanese characters. So this is one of our smaller pieces. It is a sculpture of Cupid riding on a bicycle. And you can see on the back here, his wings and then also his quiver and a, a bag that's on the back of the bicycle. So this one is much smaller than some of our other figures that we have in our collection here. And it actually was bought as a Christmas gift. So this one is, um, was bought by James II and Joseph Jr and they had actually jumped a train to go and purchase this as a Christmas present. So this is another piece and you can actually see how it was carved into the tusk that it was made out of. So carving ivory figures like this, you used chisels and you would, get it, you would cut away the rind that was on the outer layer of the tusk and then you would cut it down to the size that you would want it to be and then start using the chisel to carve into it. And a mark of a really good piece of art is if there are no chisel, chisel marks in the piece itself. That means that it was well done. This one, I believe it isn't made of elephant tusk. I believe it's made from a different type of ivory, just because of how much smaller it is than some of the other figures that we have. And you can kind of see in this one how the elephants are crossing over this type of bridge, and they increase in size as they get to this little tunnel area here. And so another interesting part about okamonos is that they weren't just made from ivory, they could also be carved out of wood. So having the wood base here goes along with the type of artwork that this was meant to be. This is another type of ivory carving. This one is much more detailed than some of the ones that we've already looked at, and it is meant to be a box. So this lid comes off and it goes about this deep. And you can see that there are lots of flowers. There's different bugs on the top of it to kind of talk about how much detail actually went into these. Um, they would take a lot of time and they were made 
specifically for tourist purposes. So this was, this may have been meant to be a type of jewelry box or something to be put on display like we have it here. And then this figure is one of the larger ones that we have in this cabinet that I've been going in and out of. This one is one of the more detailed ones as well. So this has a man with a basket. You can see this crane here inside the basket grabbing onto a fish out of his basket and another crane up at the top of his arm. And this one has a lot more intricate details. So there's more details along the base. So they've got a turtle and there's a child here trying to help him out. Um, on the back side here, you can see a seashell, a seashell and some of the sand here, or the water, as well as some of the detailing inside of his hat. So these figures were meant to appeal to Western audiences. So t kind of designing what um, Victorian people would have seen Japanese life as like. These wouldn't have been the same types of figures that a Japanese person would have had in their home. When you look at it um, under a UV light, which is a way to identify ivory, you can also see that there are certain parts of the ivory that are older than other parts, just because it is yellowed from um, patinating, which is, which is what it means when um, a piece either starts to rust or gets a sort of um, patina-like copper turning green after so long. So one of the ways to identify elephant ivory versus not elephant ivory is what's called Schrager lines. And basically what that means is that there are these cross hatching arcs that go across the ivory that you can see using a UV light. So if I shine this here, you can kind of see those cross hatching marks on the bottom of the figure that I talked about earlier, the figure of the woman. Part of the reason why ivory carving is less popular now is because people were poaching elephants to get the ivory um, from their tusks. And so there are now laws in place to keep that from happening because so many of the elephants have gone extinct. So most of the ivory carvings that you might see now wouldn't be from elephants. They might be from walrus tusks or um, some of the narwhal horns that you can obtain but they're not typically from elephants anymore just because there's so many different laws in place to protect them. On the bottom of all of our figures that we have here, there's a number, and that number is associated with this particular figure. So it's how we identify different items in our collection. And these numbers are specific to the Oliver Mansion. So our numbers for the main museum collection are different than what we use over here. Thank you for joining me today for Curiosities of Kopsch Home. We offer guided tours of the Oliver Mansion and invite you to visit our website for more information. See you next time.